Lakers say goodbye to Steve Blake and hello to Kent Bazemore and Marshawn Brooks. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Maria Soreo here at the Staples Center. We are going to join Will Lupardis on the other side in just a few minutes. But first we'll catch you up on the Laker trade. They did trade Steve Blake to the Golden State Warriors for Marshawn Brooks and Kent Bazemore. Now I had a chance to catch up with Bazemore and Pau Gasol in the locker room. What's it been like being on the floor playing for the Lakers today? Uh, it was, that's, I mean, it's a dream come true. Uh, tell everybody, you know, five, six years old in the, in the backyard playing as Kobe Bryant, playing as Michael Jordan. You know, you got that Laker uh, uniform on, and uh, you can't even fathom this moment, but uh, it, it was fun to be out there. You know, you got Floyd Mayweather talking trash to you, so it was fun. How do you feel? You played a lot of minutes out there. I feel great. You know, you know, one thing I do is work hard, you know, uh, other than my timing. I was a little bit rusty on my timing, but, you know, as far as, like, running and being in shape, you know, I, I can run with the best of them. Just energy. You know, our system is wide open. I mean, it's just about playing ball. There's not really uh, too many complicated things out there. And uh, guys just uh, moved the ball. They were aggressive. They were confident. Uh, you can tell that they've been hungry for an opportunity, and uh, they got the opportunity, and they, they did well. Uh, guys have been... Um, fighting uh, and, and probably being out there for longer than they, they should be, especially the guards. So uh, so now to have a couple more bodies, have Nick back as well, uh, I think it's going to give us a good rotation to go to and it's going to help us to keep the intensity up through through the games. I talked to him briefly. Uh, I mean, we went through a shoot around and um, you know, I try to encourage him. Um, I think they bring, they bring us great energy, some freshness two hungry guys that uh, they couldn't wait for an opportunity uh, to play and that's what we needed. We needed uh, a couple guys that really haven't been here all season long having to deal with what we had to deal with and they're just ready to play and, and um, you know and just do their best. And now on to the Clippers and Willu Pardis who's going to tell us about a big new Clipper. Take it away Will. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, the Clippers have been busy this post-trade deadline. They got rid of Antoine Jameson and Byron Mullins, a couple guys who weren't getting a lot of minutes off the Clippers bench. And they acquired Glenn Big Baby Davis. He was bought out by the Orlando Magic, and he is the piece that a lot of people think the Clippers are going to need to go into a deep run of the playoffs. That's a backup behind Blake Griffin. And Griffin's been amazing this season, and with the injury of Chris Paul, he has excelled his game to heights that we didn't think were possible but those 12 minutes a game where he's not on the floor we can really use a guy like big baby i was a little nervous at first my heart was beating really fast haven't played in a couple of days so you know i kind of felt winded a little bit did it feel good looking down seeing doc down there yeah it did it did i got deja vu when he said baby <laughs> baby i said oh <sighs> with him you always got to be ready i i knew he was going to pull on me for a little bit, so uh, glad he did. You know, it felt good. You know, I um, was really nervous out there, so, you know, got the jitters out. My first shot kind of helped me a little bit, and then I got in the flow, got, you know, a couple blocks, got some fouls. I almost fouled out, right? <laughs> so, That's your minutes worth. Uh, yeah, right? So uh, it was a good feeling, man. I'm glad we got a win. I'm glad I could contribute and, you know do something to help. So the Clippers' goal now is to move themselves into a second or third seed in the Western Conference playoffs and then give themselves some insurance for home court advantage to what we hope is a deep playoff run. Now on the other side of the Staples Center, the LA Lakers have been struggling this season, but Maria was able to catch up with a former Laker who had some winning ways on this court. Okay, we are here with Mark Madsen. Mark, you have pretty much been a part of the Laker family since day one. Let's talk about that. What's it like to be a part of this family? It's an honor to be part of the Lakers family. When I was drafted in, in 2000, I got a phone call from John Black right before I was drafted. And then right after I was drafted, Phil Jackson called me. Wow. And, and what did he say to you? What, what was his first words? Uh, Phil, I mean, Phil said, congratulations. We think you can help this team a little bit. Wow. And that made me feel good. It made me feel confident. And there were times when I felt like I did contribute. And so I was really honored to be able to be a contributor at times. And Everyone's role shifts when you're, when you're a player. Sometimes you're playing a lot of minutes. Some, sometimes you're on the end of the bench. And I tried to embrace all roles, yes. you know. Um, but it, from something as simple as when I had surgery on my wrist and Dr. Buss called me on the phone and just said, hey, I'm thinking about you. I hope your wrist is getting better. It's a tight-knit organization. Right. It's a family organization, and it's an organization that cares about its players. Right, very 
very true. When you think back, you know, you were actually going to be the head coach of the Defenders, mm -hmm. and you got a phone call from people that don't know the story. You got a phone call from the Lakers, and then they yeah. said, uh, we want you to come here instead. Tell people what happened. Well, what happened is, you know, the Lakers organization offered me the head coaching job of the Defenders, yeah. which I accepted. Mm -hmm. And I was really excited about it. I, I had D-League experience. Right. And then about a month later, Mitch Kupchak called me back and said, hey, you know, um, would you consider, th there's an opportunity that has opened up, would you consider kind of going through the interview process with Coach Dan Tony for the open spot on the Lakers staff? And he said, take the weekend and think about it. I said, okay. And he said, I'm gonna give you Mike D'Antoni's phone number. And so he gave it to me. We connected that weekend. We had a great conversation on the phone. And, uh, you know, I just really was excited mm -hmm. to work at the pro level. I was excited to learn Mike D'Antoni's system. Mm -hmm. And I was excited to come back and be part of the Lakers organization again. You know, you played with Kobe Bryant. Now you sort of see him from a different perspective. What's changed most about him, maybe his game, over the last 15 years? Kobe's always been an incredibly smart player. Right. I mean, he's brilliant on the court. He's brilliant off the court. I think he, as he's matured just with age, mm -hmm. it takes him less energy to, to do all the move. If he's in the post, he... He knows exactly when to exert energy at a high level and when to exert at a lower level. Wow. And, and the same or more effectiveness is still there. In the locker room, I mean, Kobe's always been a great teammate. Right. And it's fun to see him now. I mean, Kobe's the man. He, he, Kobe is the man in this organization. This is his team. And he knows when to push guys. He knows when to push buttons. He knows when to put his arm around somebody and be like, hey, man, shake it off. Don't worry about it. Right. He's, he's a great motivator. And, uh, you know, I played with Kobe, and now I'm coaching, yeah. and so it's it's a it's a transition, but it's a transition that that I love, and it's 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 fun to be with him again. Yeah, what's it like to be working with Pau Gasol? I know that you said you were very excited to be working with him. Yeah, well, Pau is someone who I, I'd only played against right. over the years in the NBA, and so to be on the same team with Pau, I mean, Pau has won two world championships That's in right. in the NBA. I mean, he's won world championships at the international level. Mm -hmm in international competition. He's been named MVP of major world tournaments. And so Pau is a smart player. Pau's a player that is, really gets his teammates involved through, through passing, through screens, and through just doing all the little things to help his teammates be successful. Right. You know, it's interesting. You and I talked a few minutes on the court the other night about working with younger players, yeah. which is really exciting. What is What do they see when they come out there? Uh, you know, as far as like looking at a power, a Kobe, and uh, what is it that they want to try to do to sort of be like that? What, how do you see that? I think, I think if a young player could emulate their work ethic. Mm -hmm, right. You know, you look at Pau, you look at Kobe, and you see the first thing that you really see is the tremendous level of energy, time, and preparation mm -hmm. that they put into their craft. You know, Kobe's out here all the time, right. shooting, working on pivoting. Footwork is a lost art in basketball. Interesting. Kobe's out here working on his footwork. And so I would say young players, if they can emulate that, it's going to give them a baseline to where they could go on and be very successful. Who are you most excited about as far as the young players that you're working with right now? You know, I'm excited for everyone on this team in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you look at our rookie, Ryan Kelly, right. and, and he has progressed so much from over the summertime when doctors were telling him, your career is over right. because of, you know, your, a bone healing process in his foot. And then his bone got better. Mm -hmm. right. He went to the D-League. Now he's with us as a, as a member of the team that's making big shots and big plays. So it's fun to see him as a rookie. I mean, it, it's fun to see guys that, that maybe didn't have the opportunities on other teams, mm -hmm. like a Xavier Henry, right. like a Wesley Johnson. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and in a way, like Nick Young, where his talents here are being utilized in, in greater magnitude than some other teams where maybe there was a log jam at that position. Mm -hmm. It's fun to see their energy when they're out there playing as well. <laughs> to, to me, that's what basketball is about. Yeah. It's about energy. It's, I heard a great quote one time from... Um, from a, a women's basketball coach in college, and I'm, the name is slipping out, of my, slipping out of my mind, but she said, basketball is a celebration of life. Oh, and you know, you watch s some guys on our team and you can feel that. Mm -hmm. You can right. feel that, the fans can feel it. You know, Shaq once said that uh, you beat him up pretty good in practice. <laughs> <laughs> 
If Shaq, if you're watching right now, you, you know what? Thank you for saying that, but I never want to have to guard you again, buddy, because you were the one beating me up. <laughs> Shaq, Shaq knows how to build everybody up around him. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like... You, you were kind of like that, too, though. You were the, the cheerleader guy a lot. You know, sometimes if, if, if they ask you to be the hype man, yeah. then you go out there and you embrace the role. That's right. If they ask you to go out there and guard Chris Webber, guard Shaq, yeah. guard Rashid Wallace, you go out there and you do your you best, it, yeah. you, you know. But, but just thinking about Shaq and Kobe and, and really s some of these banners back yeah, here, it, memories. What flows back is the memories. Right. And the time you spend so much time together on, on, on an NBA team that you really grow close. You do. And I think that because you know what it's like to win a championship, you know what that feeling is like. For the younger players, they, they've got to look up to that, you know? Well, I do think that there's an element of, you know, hey, look, I was never an all-star player in the NBA. I, I kind of, I played nine years, mostly based on hustle, work ethic, right. you know, determination. Mm -hmm. but, but still, I think every player in this league knows to, to play in the NBA for nine years is hard to do. That's right. And so I try to take what I learned and, and share it with the young players. I try to take what I saw from other players, like a Kevin Garnett, who I played with for three years, yeah. like a Kobe, like a Robert Ory. And then you try to share kind of those things that those guys um, taught and that those guys did, and you try to share with the younger players. Yeah. How much fun is it too to see, you know, the Michael Thompsons and you know the Big Shot and all the guys that are still working within the organization here? Well, it's a lot of fun, and, and you know, Michael Thompson. I grew up watching Michael Thompson. Yeah, of course. And so, Michael, it's funny. We were on the road in Memphis, and we were in the weight room. We had a three-hour window, and I was running on the treadmill. Michael was lifting weights before our game, and he came up to me and he said, "Hey, have you considered such and such for the player development work?" And you know. When Michael Thompson speaks, yeah. I'm all ears. Exactly. I'm yeah. all ears. And so it's great, you know, and you run into Robert Orr, you know, he'll come around to different events. He was at Kobe's charitable yeah. um, homeless found foundation event. And so it's fun to see kind of the legacy guys that have been a big part of this organization. Yeah, James Worthy. I love talking to him because yeah. he'll tell you stories and, yeah. you know, he's like so much fun. Well, it's, it, those are the guys that, that I grew up emulating. Of course. You know, now to be able to pick their brain, how how valuable is that? That's really valuable. What's it like for you to be on the other side now? You know, you <laughs> you <laughs> realize loaded question. <laughs> you realize all the work yeah, that that goes lot. into coaching. You know, as a player, you study film. Right. You you get out there. You work on your game. You work on your conditioning. But as a coach, you're doing that not for one player, but for 15 players. Right. And so the the level of time and preparation goes up dramatically. Sometimes, you know, as a player, I was never up at five in the morning during the season, ever. <laughs> you was getting in at five in the morning. <laughs> uh, maybe not quite that late. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as a coach, sometimes you're up at 5 a.m. Right, absolutely. You know, watching film, studying tendencies, um, thinking about how, how you can help the team. Okay, so looking forward, um, head coaching in the NBA someday? I would love to be a head coach, you know, but most importantly, I'm really just trying to learn in the role that I've been given here, mm -hmm. I'm trying to embrace all, all the duties that they've assigned to me, which is, you know, player development, working a little bit on analytics. Um, you know, they've given me three or four teams that I prepare our team to play against. And so I'm really trying to embrace that and really enjoy it. And then just being around the game is a lot of fun. I, I don't want to, I, I would love to be a head coach, but I don't want to get so caught up in that being the ultimate goal that I, that I don't enjoy the present because right. I'm really, you know, we're losing right now. Right. But you have to enjoy the journey, the ups and the downs. You know, it's interesting you bring that up because, you know, the Lakers are used to winning. Fans are used yeah. to them winning. But this is a process. Um, for you, it's got to look different than it does for them because, like you said, you know, you're getting better. Things are getting better. It's yeah. just that it doesn't always reflect in the game. Well, the hard thing that, that we face this year is injuries. Oh, my gosh. I mean, the, in, the injuries that have happened last year on the team and the injuries that have happened this year, it's statistically, it's kind of like, how is it possible? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so that's been frustrating. Right. And, and we've, we've lost, you know, a bunch of games. Right. And, and that hurts. And we come in and, and we're not happy. We're upset. And we're trying, but we're trying to find a way to turn it around. Right. That's our job. That's it. And that's what we're trying to do. And, and you know what? We can turn it around 
and we will turn it around. Good attitude. You got to you, have that. You, have, that. Yeah. you have got to have that. All right, last question. Uh, you're from Northern California. Are you a 49er fan? I grew up watching the 49ers, and I love the players, and their coach was at Stanford. So there's yes, that. I, I mean, exactly. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. 49ers all the way. All the way. That, that's what we wanted to hear. Mark Madsen, thanks for spending some time with us today. Thanks for coming out today, and we'll see you guys at the Staples Center yeah, soon. And a big thank you to Mark Madsen for spending some time with me. That was a lot of fun. Now, speaking of spending some time, Will Luparta sat down with Madeline Burke. She is the main host and reporter for LAC TV. So let's find out what Will found out about the Clippers from their insider, Madeline Burke. Well, I'm here with Madeline Burke, the voice of LAC TV on Clippers.com. Now, Madeline, you've been uh, on the inside with the Clippers for four years now. Mm -hmm gone through a lot of changes over the last several years. What's one of the big significant changes that you think have brought the Clippers from where they were to where they are now? Well, I think it's just been a, a collection of things. I mean, my first year here was Blake's first year here and just watching him grow as a player. I mean, the very first moment on the floor, it was that first game against Portland. I still remember like a minute into the game, he runs down, gets a lob and dunks it and everyone's just looking around like, this kid's going to be good. And I mean, he has grown so much as a player. Adding Chris Paul has made a huge difference in the product on the court and culturally, culturally in this organization. Uh, and then, you know, adding Doc Rivers. I mean, it just seems like they keep stepping up every year, every year. You keep saying, wow, can it get any better? And then it does. So it's exciting. Exactly. And some of the guys that um, they brought in to you know, change the dynamic or having to be friends and they're kind of a loose a loose bunch that uh, you know when the media talks to them sometimes they mess around with us you know a little bit and you're so on the inside that they feel comfortable doing just about anything with you what is what are some of the moments you can think of that where they've almost tried to shut an, an interview down your stand-up's gone wrong and they're walking through the shot like how are these guys to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis interviewing I mean it happens all the time uh, so much so that every year I put together a reel a blooper reel and it takes a lot of time cutting down the blooper reel. Because I'm thinking, okay, we can't make this 20 minutes, so let me see if I can make it four. Um, but I mean, guys come in, walk into my shots all the time, and I'll be doing an interview. There was one year where, I think at the beginning of the year, Blake walked through the interview, and he was like, hey, where's the bathroom? And that became the trend for the year. Now, every interview I did, somebody would walk through, hey, where's the bathroom? Where's the bathroom? Or, you know, just like dancing through the shot, or making noises, or, I mean, it's, it's like they want to, you know, they want to get the attention. They want to walk through. It's just, it's fun, though. These guys have fun with it, and I enjoy it. I love those interviews. Like, those are my favorite when, you know, the guys will walk through or they'll mess around because it makes it more, it makes it more exciting, more personable. Now, tell us um, a little bit about the work you do in general. You're you're on LAC TV, which can be found on Clippers.com. You also do work with uh, 980 AM. How do you split the difference on a game night? Well, it's not so much splitting the difference because a lot of it overlaps. For example, the stuff I do with LAC TV is a lot of pre-game, post-game content where I do interviews with the players in the locker room after the game or um, previews for an upcoming game or, you know, shoot-around reports, practice reports, things like that. Whereas the 980 stuff is all in-game. It's live on the radio. Brian Seaman does a fantastic job calling the game. Then he'll toss it down to me every once in a while and say, hey, you know, what do you have? So I'll update things out of the huddle, or I'll interview an assistant coach at halftime, and we'll talk about, hey, what are the adjustments you guys need to make? And then that helps Brian get some more information other than just what his eyes and ears can see himself. So it's, it's fun. What are some of the keys you think the Clipper team has to do to make their mark on the West and um, you know do better than they have in previous seasons in the playoffs? It's just consistency, I think. You know, I think consistency is a big key. Um, because you've seen sometimes this, these games, these players will, you know, they start off strong and then they let up or they play to the level of their competition as, as they've admitted sometimes that they can do. So they can keep playing the type of basketball that we've seen them play consistently no matter who's on the other end of the court and keep the morale up and stuff like that because I think they have the talent, they have the coaching staff, they have the smarts and the ability to do it. They just need to have the, the momentum and the want to, to to make the push. That's right. And now with this, we know that Darren Collison, our backup point guard, is starting level point guard. I mean, he's started for a few years as well, too. So, I mean, he, he could start on so many teams in this league. And he said he wanted to come to the Clippers because... 
for him, it's not about being a starting point guard. It's about the best opportunity to win a championship, and he saw that here, so that's why he decided to be a backup point guard again and uh, go for a championship. Well, thanks a lot, Madeline. I appreciate you joining us. And you can find all her inside work with the Clippers on LAC TV on clippers.com. And a big thank you to Madeline for sitting down for that interview with us. Now, baseball season is just around the corner, and the Dodgers and Angels are right now in spring training. But before they left, Maria was able to catch up with some of the Los Angeles Dodgers at a little event we call FanFest. <laughs> For a while, so that feels good. Good, to, good to be in the cage and hitting and, and doing all those things, and and uh, you know, pain free. My shoulders pain free, and uh, I'm excited about that. It's been a while since uh, I haven't uh, felt anything in my shoulder, and that's a, that's that's a, that's a good step in the right direction. I'm just excited to be healthy, man. I can't wait till I'm all the way healthy and all the way back there on the field playing again. I miss the competitive the competitiveness of the game, and uh, just miss, miss miss baseball. Period. So uh, it'll be fun to, to get back out there and play with the boys. Every, every, every season is important to me. You know, this last year and a half has been pretty tough, but you know, injuries are part of the game. It is what it is. It's the way you bounce back, and uh, you know, hopefully this year is a, it's going to be a, a great season for me and the Dodgers. When the month of January comes, then everything goes fast. But prior to that, it goes slow getting to January. But I think we, you know, we have a great ball club, and there's no doubt in my mind with the type of team that we have that we shouldn't be in the world. See, I hate to say that because then I'm putting the manager on the spot, you know, and I don't want to do that. But I'm just saying that I'm hoping, let's just say that, I'm hoping that we, we can win it this year. Um, basically, you know, I had an extra month off this year. I went ahead and started working out early, putting on weight, and just really trying to get as best shape as I can, you know, ready for the season and uh, trying to make that World Series push. I got a little, like, rookie feeling again coming back out here seeing everyone out for the first time in a long time it's great anytime you get out here and see so many people you know rooting for you come on you can't beat it it's all about the fans it's all about getting that energy it's all about getting a world championship uh, they brought some new guys in this year that are going to mold with the the guys that are here they've got a great team so i think the fans really are more excited about getting this season started than, than anybody in baseball right now for baseball season and on our next show I will be out in Arizona with the Angels and the Dodgers bringing you the very latest and while I'm there will you will be right here at the Staples Center keeping track of our Lakers and Clippers yes Maria while you're out in Arizona working on your tan I will be here in Los Angeles keeping everybody privy to what's happening in the NBA that's right well my tan needs a lot of work you and I have been in the Staples Center now for five months it's time for baseball all right, well, actually, right now it's time to talk about racing. We want to congratulate Dale Earnhardt Jr., who won the Daytona 500. What a great way to start the season. And to remind you, we are days away from the IndyCar season starting in St. Petersburg. And then next month, we will be at the Long Beach Grand Prix right here in Southern California. So make your plans to join us. It's a lot of fun. And don't forget, you can see us anytime you want, 24-7 at playingthefieldtv.com. That will do it for us. Before we go, we're going to leave you with one of our interviews with the Clipper Spirit dance team. I'm Maria Soreo for Will Lupardis, who's sitting there on the other side of the Staples Center. We'll see you next time. We're here with Tatum from Clipper Spirit. Now, Tatum, I know that you are not new at this, but you did have to audition again this year to make the team. And I really want to explain to people what you guys go through because you're amazing dancers. You've got to memorize a lot. Um, and take me through the process of, of what it's like when you audition. Well, it's a week process, and anyone can audition. Basically, we start off and learn. We go across the floor and do a little 
combo, like kicks and turns, just to see if you have any background. They make their first cut, and then we have a jazz choreographer come in, teach us a jazz routine. We do a few counts of eight, and we perform that to the judges. They make a second cut, and then we have a third round where it's the hip-hop routine. Then after that, there's about 35 to 40 girls that are left for finals. We do interviews, so they get to know your personality and um, your, your schedule, if you have time to do this. And then we have our final dancing round. We do a little solo. We do the routines we learned again, and then they make their last cut, and then you find out I think within the next two days after that final round if you made it. You know, what's the toughest part for you? I would say, hmm, the toughest part would probably be being remembering them just because you're only given like the hip hop round super fast. That This last audition, it was probably like we learned it in, I want to say 15 to 20 minutes and it was like, go for it. And they even said, they're like, we know you guys are tired, but just leave it out on the floor so yeah how much dance experience did you have going in I have been dancing since I was five so I she's got she's life. got like a few years of dance just experience a, just a little bit <laughs> and what kind of dance um, I've done it all I was on a competition team so I did like jazz ballet hip-hop tap how many dances do you memorize here so far we have about 16 memorized and Actually, Sunday we're learning a new one, and we just keep learning new throughout the season and switch them out, and yeah. So it is a lot. It's a lot to remember. It, it is a lot, you know. And I think that a lot of times people don't understand the process that you go through, all of the all of the rehearsals and the practices, and and then like you said, you know, you're in the middle of the season and you're learning a new dance for the first time. Yeah, yeah. So it is a lot, but it's worth every second of it. <laughs> What's it been like being a part of this team since the team has been on such an amazing role? It's been, I've had the time of my life. It's been such an amazing experience and I'm so blessed to have this opportunity and get to do what I love. And I love basketball too. So I love watching the game and you know, being up so close and it's just amazing all around. <laughs>